intellectual stepping stones to the theory of evolution. So uh, what are the stepping stones? So we will first see that Linnaeus and his tax, the contributions in taxonomy, uh, you know, uh, Linnaeus is Carl Linnaeus, right? The, the Swedish father of ta the discipline taxonomy. Malthus, uh, Malthus is a British demographer. So he was working with the field of the population, you know, the dynamics of the population, how the population grows, you know, and also exponential growth, isn't it? And also what are the factors influencing population? What, what happens to the population during the types of times of crisis? You know, all these things are uh, what you learn in the discipline called demography and the father of demography is Malthus. You know? And Hutton, Lyell and uh, their contribution something called uniformitarianism. Uh, they are geologists, you know. And then the Lamarck, uh, the French uh, natural historian. And his first comprehensive theory of evolution and of course uh, the adaptation, right. Uh, Lamarck is predicted for, uh, you know, discovering or formulating the concept of adaptation first time. Adaptation is the central stage of Darwin's theory of evolution, you see. And then we will see that the voyage of Baker and Wallace and Darwin, all those things in subsequent lectures. So in this uh, brief video is all about what are the stepping stones. So you know Linnaeus is a 16th century Swedish physician and botanist. It's very interesting combination isn't it. He was a medical physician and he's also a botanist. Uh, he's of course is very well known in the field of botany rather than in physiology. And his landmark book had been Systema Naturae published in 1735. Uh, basically he's from Uppsala in Sweden. And he founded the science of taxonomy, the branch of biology concerned with naming and classifying living things. So it's not just plant taxonomy, but also for animal taxonomy you know, or microbial taxonomy. The whole field of taxonomy, uh, you can credit to the Linnaeus. Very interesting, isn't it? So the way that you classify organism and the way you name the organism, you see that uh, the names of organisms have got two parts, right? Genus and species. And so many related species are classified in the same genus. So many related genus are classified in the same family, then order, phyla, kingdom, all those things, right? So how this relationship is being measured? So that relationship is in biology, relationship means, uh, you know, they are similar because of common ancestry, that is because of the evolution. See the connection? So it's uh, the classification is based on evolution so evolution plays a crucial role on classifying living things you know so that is what the Linnaeus and his theory of uh, taxonomy is all about uh, rather it's not a theory but his method of classifying organisms into uh, various hierarchies so these are hierarchical right rank based uh, taxonomic system which, which has come kind of out of favor these days with the advent of uh, you know phylogenetic systematics which doesn't have any ranks you know so uh, yeah so he developed the two-part system of the binomial nomenclature that we still use today so this clustering uh, on various hierarchical level so related categories like families classes phyla and kingdom so though he didn't know or rather believe in evolution by descent because he predates the Darwin's theory you see uh, Linnaeus lived earlier than the Darwin and of course the, the framework provided a very interesting pattern for thinking about the evolution uh, from the common ancestor so even though it is not implicit in his method of the taxonomy but it's implied though it is not explicit it's implied in his taxonomy that uh, there is a common descent you know common ancestor from where uh, we all descended, all forms of living organisms on planet earth has been descended from that common ancestor. That is what the, the theory is about, right? So for him the relatedness meant propinquity, that is closeness in the creator's design because prevailing theory of evolution was creation myth, right? Uh, the theory of intelligent design, isn't it? ID. So intelligent design uh, is not scientific, it's a pseudoscience, okay? So, yeah, that, uh, you cannot blame Linnaeus for it, right? Because that is the time that he was in. And the prevailing theory during those time was creation. You know, so we now know that creation is a myth. 
signed there are a host of evidences substantiating that uh, evolution is rather true not the creation creation means a divine supernatural entity created the entire uh, uh, organisms on planet earth and these organisms are not um, evolving these are unmutable or immutable essence that is total uh, essentialism remember right so the this is what you call it as phenetic clustering the lineage uh, you know the, the clustering based only upon the morphology the relatedness so phenetic clustering we now use uh, in uh, you know uh, for example in microarray data and also several of the phylogenetic methods are based on this initial phenetic clustering method for example neighbor joining or upgma give me a second i got a call in between right so let me put it in silent mode right uh, so yes yeah, so relatedness i told you about that so phenetic clustering right phenetic clustering is all about uh, you are clustering the phenotype data that is morphological data based on the similarity so the most similar things you are clustering into the same clade like that so that is what the phenetic clustering is right and uh, yes yeah, so this is a very landmark essay published in the uh, 18th century by uh, you know Malthus principle of population though it is an essay but it's actually a book you know and uh, this is a very old book and of course in a public domain archives.org or you can just search or in google books also it's available and i have linked up in the course website uh, this the gist of this essay is that uh, you know so people tend to have more children than can possibly survive we tend to overproduce you know so resources are limited and we tend to make more babies than they can survive so that means that ultimately some babies will die you know so that is the reason for famines you know like plague or right now it is covid 19 is going on so if you interpret that in uh, in the way that malthus thought the, he, according to his philosophy these are all uh, you know these are all natural process to revert back the equilibrium the lost equilibrium you know so he was a 18th century economist uh, of course he was a demographer and this he was published in 1798 and you know the, the Darwin read it uh, this essay and it had a profound impact on Darwin's theory of evolution you know so the Darwin uh, he was quite uh, influenced by this essay and he noted that every species not just human being and Darwin noted of course we are also a, 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 an animal isn't it so that you know that that particular uh, spark of uh, you know the idea that we are also just a, an, a yet uh, just an animal just like any other species of animal for example a finch or the bird in Galapagos you know so that is very interesting that is a unique attribute of the Darwin you see so what Darwin thought is that every species this uh, you know uh, what Malthus uh, said about human population which is applicable to every populations of uh, you know animal every species of animals you see so every species have more offsprings than can be expected to survive so that means the overproduction is is common across the species so species tend to produce more offspring than they can survive so there is a competition now going on who is going to survive right when uh, more offsprings are come you know the sibling rivalry right so yeah so that competition is definitely there it's not just among siblings but also among different individuals of the same species to find the mate for example uh, to eat and to reach a reproductive maturity for example all these things the competition play a crucial role so this kind of uh, of course Malthus was an economist demography is a sub-discipline of economics right uh, though the Darwin was a biologist the, you know the, the evolutionary biologist so there is a huge there is a very interesting cross talk between these two fields economics uh, especially with ecology and evolution you know so these two disciplines are really related with economics so i suggest you if you haven't yet subscribe to two very good podcast i'm a frequent subscriber frequent listener of these two podcasts free economics radio uh 
the one that explores the hidden side of everything. And NPR's Planet Money, that is by National Public Radio. It's, it's like All India Radio of uh, here in India. NPR is equivalent to the AIR in the United States. You know, so very good economic broadcast. So it's very important. The economics play a crucial role. And uh, yeah, so now coming to the next field of geology, you know, the Nicolas Steno is a very famous, uh, you know, the geologist, one of the very old geologists from uh, Italy. And he conceived the so-called Steno's principles of, uh, uh, you know, the, the geology, especially uh, original ho horizontality. Originally, all these rock layers were formed from the, the, the you know, what if you dig it, Deep, deep uh, layers are oldest, while the top layers are youngest. So that is, that is the reason is that originally that is how the horizontal layers are formed in horizontal pattern, and whatever deformation you can see now like this, are uh, because of the later the deformation arises later, while uh, you know layers formed earlier. So another one is original lateral continuity. So layers have got the same layers everywhere in the world if you look. For example, Cambrian deposits that is actually digged from Cambria in uh, east of England, and that Cambria that name comes from that. But that doesn't mean that if you if you dig here, you won't find the Cambrian. Yes, you can get it here also in India, or also in Antarctica. If you dig that deep, the, the layer is called Cambrian. So it's all same. So that is called lateral continuity, and superposition, right? Younger or older. So the uh, younger layers are on the uh, top, while older uh, is on the bottom. All these things are called Steno's law, right? So that is uh, that that also is a stepping stone towards the theory. You see, George Quiver, uh, he, he was also a, a you know 18th century geologist. Rather, he was a biostratigraphist, right? So his biostratigraphy is about the uh, you know how the fossils have been deposited around the geographical area, right? So especially he was working with mammoth fossils, you know. So uh, he did so-called comparative anatomy. So he compared the anatomical features of various mammoth fossils to deduce on its behavioral patterns and its uh, uh, population and also the, the classification, see the taxonomy of the mammoth fossils. So all these things he, he achieved through comparative anatomy. So taxo what, whatever that informs taxonomy, uh, the basic idea is evolution because evolution is why uh, the taxonomy groups have been formed right i told you when we discussed about the lineos so most of the earth's history was characterized by geologic catastrophes you know so this is very interesting idea of this cure and uh, this is uh, what has emerged and spread among the scientists in the so-called catastrophism the cures catastrophism is the theory so yeah so he's a famous biostratigrapher from france then comes george's buffon in 1750s he studied the fossils and found that earth is much older than 6000 years uh, what is in the bible what is what the usual the uh, you know the abrahamic religions were always saying that earth is only 6000 years remember the date 4004 bc the uh, the vice chancellor of the the University of Cambridge. He even calculated the exact time. You know, if you if you read his uh, work, the essay, you will see that the, when the God created the the world that we we know uh, now exists, and also entire species on planet Earth. So exact time at the year BC 4004. Very interesting. So some fossils are similar to the living organism. So the the Buffon criticized that worldview the creation myth he he's the first one to say that creation is nothing but it's a myth uh, in modern time of course if you look back in time of course there were creation itself is only 2000 years old right that myth earlier time i told you like in hindutva uh, there is no nothing like that kind of myth right 1.7 billion years is it's really really old as per the veda which is pretty close to what science now say 4. Uh, five billion years is the, the latest approximation you see so other famous geologist uh, who uh, contributed on to this uh, dialogue prior to darwin include hutton and lyle so english geologist james hutton 
uh, he was in 18th century, proposed that it was possible to explain the geological form land formations by the processes that are currently in operation such as erosion and sedimentation. So if you look at the rate of erosion, erosion is how the rocks are eroded, you know. Uh, it washes away, right? The, the rock layer, it gets uh, degraded like the sedimentary rock. So that is what the rock erosion, ultimately rock weathers to form the soil, isn't it? So it, it's very, very slow. That is what the, the pebbles, if you ever go to the Himalayas or any, any rivers, you will see very beautiful pebbles. So these pebbles have been an enormous mass and because of this weathering over millions of years, you will see the pebbles like this. You see this pebble, this is from Ganges plain of the Himalayas, you know, so uh, I mean in, in the Ganges, you know. So yeah, so pebbles like this are being formed by the weathering and the formation takes millions of years. You know, it's very slow process. So how does it happen if creation is true? In the biblical creation in the Old Testament if you take it at the face value if you take it in literal sense then you cannot even explain how the pebbles like this form so that is what Hutton said first or canyons like Grand Canyon in Nevada right in the US so canyons were cut by erosion of the stream because of the erosion uh, uh, by the stream the river and the river uh, you know after millions of years of river flow, rivers started cutting these canyons, you see. And layers of sediments were the, again, deposition of the sediments, you know. That is also a very slow process. So if you look at the rate at which these are being formed, uh, considering the rates are same across the geologic age, uh, then, you know, 6,000 years is rather too less to explain. You, want, you need millions, of, rather billions of years to explain you know how the, the the rock formations have formed and that is what you call it as gradualism it's a gradual process it's a very slow process uh, you know the, the darwin's theory of evolution is also you can call it as a gradualistic process because evolution happens very slowly you know it's not a fast evolving right very slowly mutation happen and among the mutants among the vari variants some variants are preferentially being selected because they are adapted that is exactly what natural selection is, right? It's a very slow process, isn't it? The gradualism. So, uh, the, the Charles Lyell, he expounded that principles of the uniformitarianism. So, uh, it's like gradualism, but it's a uniform, the, his theory is called uniformitarianism. Uh, that means that whatever the force which is in operation right now has been seen throughout the Earth's geologic history, you see? Same processes operated in the past as well as in the present. So what you, what you can see today, like the weathering of the rocks, and the same forces were in force for last many years, many thousands years or millions or billions years. Right? So that is why it's very, very slow process. So that is the reason why you cannot explain that for within just a matter of 6,000 years. So Earth must be immensely old, you know. So that is what the uniform materialism is also said. So Hutton, Lyell, all this work, Darwin is aware of it. And that is the reason it, it might have influenced tremendously, you know. And uh, yeah, so that these are the real stepping stones. You see that, uh, of course, uh, Charles Lyell is now considered as the father of modern geology. And the idea that the geological processes in operation now operated similarly in the past at about the same rate and which is quite similar to molecular clock hypothesis uh, that means that the changes in the DNA sequence that is uh, being accumulated at right now like how many mutations per unit time uh, let us say you know two mutations per month that is the rate at which a COVID-19 the, the novel coronavirus SARS-CoV-2 is evolving you know the average two mutation happens across the world in one month you know so well that that is not same across the lineage the covid 19 mutated much faster than human being you see but that rate at which this random mutation happen is more or less same across uh, the geologic time that is exactly what molecular clock hypothesis you can relax it to accommodate more complicated uh, models you know the, the mathematical equations you know with more parameters right but more or less it's quite similar molecular clock hypothesis as well as uniformity molecular clock is for biology 
but uniformitarianism is for the geology you know so of course uh, the darwin did carry uh, some of the works of lyell during his voyage you know so the, the influence was tremendous so uniformitarian view of the nature requires vast amounts of time to explain the present state of earth so if you look at the the pebbles like this and how slow the process is if i keep this pebble in the river and i i pick it up next year what is the weight the difference in weight very insubstantial right uh, maybe nanogram might have uh, reduced so that is per one year one nanogram now if you actually uh, go back uh, you know in time how many years might have uh, happened so you can calculate that right it's a very slow process you see millions of years it takes for rock weathering isn't it so yeah that is what the uniform you need a, a, a considerable amount of time to explain all these processes so yeah so Lyell is now considered as the, the father of the modern geology who wrote the principles of geology the, the, the uh, you know very, uh, fundamental principles of the geology and there is another very interesting groups of scientists during those years 18th and 19th century Neptunist and Plutonist so what is the difference between these two Neptunism uh, after the Abraham Gottlob Werner uh, Werner is a German uh, natural historian so according to him the rocks were formed out of sedimentation from the ocean so ocean of course we know that it has got salt and other minerals so that mineral keep on sedimenting to form uh, something like a sandstone or siltstone you know so all these rocks are sedimentary rock isn't it so that sedimentation is the root cause of rocks according to neptunist you know at the same time plutonist another group uh, uh, they are also known as volcanist uh, like james hutton the geologist they thought that the, the rocks were formed in fire you know so very drastic uh, views you know these two views are challenging but there is a there is a lot of disputes between these two groups of scientists not just two, two scientists but they formed groups you know inside the geologic societies so now what we know is that it's it's actually a, a both are right some uh, rocks are sedimentary uh, which follows the neptunist point of view while some are uh, sedimentary metamorphic huh? both are uh, neptunist views while others like igneous rocks are protonist point of view so you, you can see a lot of interesting stories like this if you read this book bill bryson's a short history of nearly everything this is my number one recommended reading for high school student so of course uh, whoever is watching this video need not be a high school student you know? or grown-ups also you you can enjoy this book it's a very nice book it's a thick book but it's highly enjoyable read it gives you a lot of behind the scene uh, stories about you know the scientists and their contributions so it's very very nice book please have a look right and Jean Baptiste Lamarck is yet another scientist and he was a French scientist you see and he developed the first comprehensive model of evolution though Lamarck is these days uh, discredited for his uh, use and disuse theory like if you use uh, some uh, part of your body often you know then it becomes stronger like giraffe the classic example is giraffe's neck right G giraffe they they want to have uh, the leaves and fruits uh, at uh, you know at a tree uh, you know the the tall trees then they stru started stretching its lung you know the, the uh, this one the uh, neck and that is the reason that the giraffes have a very long neck because it used that organ it stretched out right so that is of course the fallacious point but uh, unfortunately Lamarckism went uh, uh, out of interest most of the time because he was considered like a pseudo scientist but he was not he was not a pseudo scientist he was a proper scientist you know and uh, he was a French zoologist curator of the invertebrate collection in the Paris Museum natural history museum in Paris uh, I got a chance to visit that museum and Lamarck's collection you know uh, way back in 2019 that is just two years back so Lamarck saw many lines of the descent along the fossil invertebrates that he encountered so you know it's not just a one scalar natural like Aristotle but instead of one line there are multiple lines of 
thing. So it's also quite similar to Darwin's, uh, you know, the the tree of life, which has got multiple branches. You know? So that is quite similar, but it's not exactly the same because the Lamarck's theory didn't include common descent for all organisms on planet. You see, there are multiple descendants because multiple ancestors result in multiple uh, descents. You see, so that is what. So he proposed that the organisms increased in complexity through time because of an innate tendency. It's like it's like climbing the ladder of evolution with the human being as on the top mammals will be a little bit lesser while bacteria or viruses will be the bottom but that is incorrect view you know so there is no ladder in evolutionary theory you know because bacteria uh, that is living current day back though it looks very uh, simple organism if you go back in time uh, bacteria is also you know uh, around 4 billion years uh, apart from the first organism on planet earth which is also a bacteria isn't it so the, the origin of life if you look around four billion years back that happened abiogenesis happened so that organism and current day living bacteria are also separated by four billion years so it's not that uh, you know so from uh, uh, less complex or the pattern of evolution is always towards a complexification it's incorrect to presume that way so Lamarck is wrong in that but he proposed uh, you know the adaptation that will come in a short while so what you now call it as Lamarckism is that interaction of the organism and the environment drove the process of evolution it's not the gene centric but it's more environment centric you know in philosophy there is a very interesting debate about nature and nurture nature means by birth many traits we get it by birth for one good example is intelligence you cannot in increase i mean of course if you learn better you can increase your intelligence i mean you can you can learn many things you know but the basic faculty of intelligence like iq remains more or less same throughout your lifetime you know because intelligence is strongly uh, you know uh, determined by our genes at the same time environment also plays crucial role so many of our traits have got both environment and uh, you know the, the genes right so that is what the nature and nurture so nurture means the way that you grew up like parenthood is your mom educated yes so that is one of the major factor determining uh, the children's success in their life if your mom is educated you know working women uh, if your mom is like that then chances are high that you will automatically become successful repeated studies have uh, shown the same line of evidence so nature and nurture it's like a mix you know both are important just like that Lamarck centered on a nurture while Darwin centered on nature you know so if you look only environment plays a role that is fallacious or if you say only that the uh, you know genes are important environment doesn't matter at all then what is the point of our life if everything is uh, coded in our genes we have no control with our life isn't it so that is also wrong so you, you know you need both isn't it so characteristics occurred during individuals lifetime could be passed on to our offspring uh, that is something called inheritance of acquired character which is wrong isn't it whatever i do uh, during my lifetime you know for example i go to antarctica i've been to antarctica right and had i been living there for a long time then uh, probably you know melanin expression level will be much lesser you know and uh, i mean so many like uv concentration is high so my body might be making a lot of anti uv compounds so does that mean that if i have an, an offspring after i return from antarctica the offspring also will get all these uh, qualities incorrect isn't it so or uh, you know differently abled persons uh, you know th those unfortunate uh, individuals who lack the limb for example the the people in the Paralympics uh, when they have babies uh, they are also born with the uh, you know deformalities no right so that is why it is wrong uh, use and disuse theory uh, this is currently discredited but there is a catch there is a trend now the so-called so neo Lamarckism because above the genetics there is something called epigenetics 
expression levels of the genes. So these expression levels of the genes can be transmitted to the next generation. You know, so epigenetics is quite similar to what Lamarck was saying. So Lamarck is, uh, you know, discounting the Lamarckism as pseudoscience is wrong. You know, so epigenetic, uh, you know, the uh, transmission of traits are quite similar to what Lamarck had been saying. So this is what the Lamarck's theory of the scale of organization, you see, chain of being as we observe today. So for example, today we have human beings. So human being, uh, you know, uh, evolved, the evolution is very interesting and with the adaptation. So all these are the, uh, you know, the characteristics of the Lamarck's theory. But instead of just one chain, like as in Aristotle, uh, Aristotle's essentialism, so like bacteria turned into another species to another species finally we are here human homo sapiens uh, he thought there are multiple chains of being you know and the spontaneous generation that is basically the abiogenesis happens even today that is what the lamarckism that is incorrect again uh, abiogenesis happened only once in our life lifetime once or a few times uh, you know way back in four billion years the reason is that the you know the local weather conditions were conducive during then you know uh, extreme uh, temperature right and also the the kind of constituents it's an abiotic environment right there is no oxygen at that time right all these things are really good and also uh, lightning strikes were also very high and asteroid impacts were also pretty high during those time so right now what the environment we have today it's not conducive if at all there is a new life form like a new bacteria is being formed from matter it will uh, very soon it will be devoured by other uh, you know organism isn't it so it cannot survive and yes yeah, so there is abiogenesis itself is uh, different from spontaneous generation like Lazaro Spallanzani is the first Italian who disproved it the spontaneous generation is like you take out a meat a piece of meat you expose it then after a few days you will see worms so people used to think that okay these worms are actually produced by the meat wrong isn't it now we have uh, proof that this is not right you know so that spontaneous generation is different from abiogenesis abiogenesis is the origin of life you see the first life formed you know so that it, this there are not multiple chains only one chain uh, but again uh, Aristotle is also wrong it's not just simple one chain there are multiple branches so you need to combine Lamarckism with Aristotelian essentialism to make the tree of life you know there are multiple branches but the root is same one root interesting isn't it so adaptation is uh, the original idea of the, the Lamarck so the dynamic evolutionary processes that fits the organism to their environment so whatever is prevailing here in Bathinda is not same as where you are living right maybe you are from Kerala uh, or Western Ghats or uh, you know East India so everywhere the local conditions are different or Antarctica right or Sahara Desert so everywhere the, the ecological niche is different right environment is different so you need to adapt to the environment local uh, environment so only those individuals that can that are flexible enough to adopt uh, to the the local environment can sustain they can reach the uh, reproductive age you know they can survive to reproduce to pass on the genes to the next generation so adaptation is the key for natural selection you see so these are the traits adaptations are nothing but traits that increase the individual's resource utilization potential and through which it increases the organisms the individual's chance of surviving to reproduce you know so that is what the adaptation is about. So the traits that increase an organism's fitness is what the adaptation is. So these are the organisms that are better suited to the environment to survive and reproduce. So and again, the adaptation is relative to the other individuals, you see. So if you are more fit than other individuals, then you can say that, uh, you know, you will survive to reproduce because reproduction is... Uh, there is a competition element right so you are competing with other members of the same species you know so uh, in summary that uh, the view of the uh, you know the, uh, this uh, scientist uh, you know so uh, the Lamarckism right Lamarck 
is that there is multiple chains of being the scala naturae there are multiple and in each one you can see that there is basically uh, you know there is actually adaptive force so vertebrates there is adaptation uh, that this adaptive force is the reason for species in general right but major uh, you know groups of organisms like mollusk or vertebrates or worms or jellyfish the difference is because of the complexifying force like body plants that this force is responsible for phyla while adaptive force is responsible for species and genera which is incorrect you know uh, uh, this concept itself is very fallacious but still that is what the theory of uh, adaptation of the Lamarck but uh, whatever be this is completely incorrect a uh, depiction of what uh, adaptive force is but still the basic concept of adaptation remains same you know organism uh, you know the differential survival and reproduction because of its resource utilization to the local habitat you know uh, that that uh, is a uh, the central uh, you know concept of Darwin's theory of evolution as well 